I'd like to introduce uh, Alan, who is the uh, VP of Personnel at the Brady Corporation. And uh, he has been there for many years. He uh, is well thought of in the community. I've never met him before, but you're going to meet him this morning. And uh, Dr. Kelly, who is uh, collaborative, they're collaboratively working, uh, and she's from MSOE. We're here to talk about servant leadership, and the end of our story will definitely tie into servant leadership. But I think the thing that's really cool about this for us is it didn't start that way. It didn't start with a book where we said, okay, we've got to learn this and start practicing it. It started with who we were. And Sally, when you talked about bringing the whole person to life, what resonated with us and my team was the fact that it brought out who we were, and that was a common language that we ended up speaking. So. Um, just a brief note in, of introduction. Dick, thanks for the, uh, for the introduction there. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Kelly Otten. Kelly is a PhD, has a PhD in adult education. She is a professor here at MSOE, but more importantly for this case, she's my coach. Kelly and I met each other a long time ago when I was doing some professional development as part of my company and Kelly was teaching us. And uh, in her one-hour course, I was so intrigued by the things that she was teaching that I thought it would help me build a stronger team. At that point in time, I was leading our Asia-Pacific business. So I was the head of Asia for 14 years for Brady. And I was struggling. I just want to talk a little bit about the team that I asked Kelly for help with. And I'm not going to read the names or the nationalities, but it was interesting as I went over to Asia, and I'm obviously an American from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, this was the leadership team that I inherited. These were people that you can see across 10 different cultures. And so when you talk about building a high performance work team, think of your own instances of which you've had people from maybe South Milwaukee and uh, Sheboygan and the different cultures that exist there, and then try to multiply that by 100 and looking at this team. So Kelly helped us go down a journey and learn more about this. And the wonderful thing about Kelly is I just don't like sitting in a classroom and learning it. It's nothing against MSOE or any other education institution like that. I like to practice it in real life. And so I said to Kelly, you've got to help me come and build this strong team, but I want to do it in a unique way. And these were the instructions that I gave Kelly as our consultant. We were growing very rapidly as a team at that point in time. And I can say that myself and my leadership team was growing so fast that it grew beyond where any of us were in our career. And so my first thing that I wanted to say to Kelly is help us to prepare for an environment where we've never been before. In our case professionally, that was sales growth and profit growth and a geographic expansion that we've never experienced. I also wanted us to experience a culture that we had never experienced before. And if you remember the last page, that's pretty challenging because we had almost every culture covered except Vietnam. And as a practical note, we also recognize that Vietnam would be a potential area for expansion of us in the future. So not only would we get to learn about each other and building a team, but to learn about a new environment. And finally, in Asia, the culture is very much of respect for a leader and not challenging a leader. And so the final thing that we said is that I needed to be removed from the leadership role. I could participate as the team, but I could no longer be the leader figure as we went through this for a week. And finally, and this is really where servant leadership comes together, I said, I don't want to do it in a classroom. When we leave Vietnam, somehow Vietnam has to be better as a result of my team being there. And so with that, I want to turn the microphone over to Kelly to talk about how she led my team, and then I'll come back at the end and tell you what the results were from my perspective. I'm actually going to turn this to him. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? It's an electrical problem. Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> thanks. So the team was set up. They weren't giving very much uh, instructions at all. They were to go to Ho Chi Minh City. We were going to be working on a week-long project. And by the way, Al, who they followed and respected and uh, really wanted to uh, him to be the leader all the time, he could not serve as the leader, which was a huge challenge for them. So that's what we gave them. They arrived them. Then we set them up with this project. So we worked with a local organization, uh, a group of sisters from the Siena project, or from Siena, and they had a multi-complex. Uh, it actually spread across uh, Ho Chi Minh City. 
uh, and outside of Ho Chi Minh City. It included a health clinic, uh, primary and secondary schools, a retirement home for abandoned uh, senior citizens, specifically women, and a vocational <coughs> school to teach women uh, a trade, which was sewing. So this team entered and we worked to learn about these individuals' needs. The logistics were the team was given $2,000. Uh, okay, see if that works better. They were given $2,000 uh, to do this project, which really wasn't that much. Um, they, we started on Monday, and they needed to complete and have a project completed by Friday. Just like everything else in our world, it's compressed. We have to get things done rapidly. We need to understand the problem and have some action very rapidly. Their job was to engage with the customers. In this case, it was the students. It was the, um, the participants uh, as far as the patients, the uh, women, the uh, older women as well as the younger women, the retirees, and try and figure out what were their needs and how could they meet them. Now that sounds really easy if you have a leader that's saying, okay, you go talk to this person, you go talk to this person, you go talk to this person. But remember, we wanted to have them learn to be a high-performing team with this multinational composition, and we wanted to make sure that Al was not necessarily on that pyramid that we oftentimes see, at the top of that pyramid, leading everything. So these are some dilemmas that we encounter. And these are really cross-cultural dilemmas that we see when we work with individuals. Again, it doesn't matter where we're working with them, but this happened to be across Asia. And the dilemmas were, how do we go from the specific to the diverse? Meaning, US individuals from the United States are oftentimes very task-focused. Here's the task, get it done. Versus context-focused. What's the big picture? What do we need to look at? And in this case, it was, is our goal to paint? to improve the quality of the lives of, let's say, the senior citizens that lived in this very dingy um, living environment, or to do something different? Was it to focus on the technical? What could we actually build? What could we give them financially? Or was it to look at, how can we improve their community? How can we improve their life in, in general? We also looked at this as far as dilemmas of short-term versus long-term. We kind of had, the, the, some of the Westerners kind of had the mentality of, we're going to go in, we're going to do something, we're going to feel good about it, and then we're going to leave. But in other parts of the world, time is much longer, much, much longer than we have. And so how did that work? How did that also work as far as analyzing the situation, discussing, having those conversations, turning to each other, learning about each other? How do we also delegate authority, since Al could no longer necessarily wear the hat of the leader? And how do we look at this from individual parts? It's really easy to break this down into parts. How can we look at this from a, as a whole? What does that mean? And how can we act in the best interest of society, not just our best interest, making us feel good at the end of the day? Now, we put them in the situation to go analyze all this. At first, it was individuals going around analyzing it, not necessarily talking with each other, talking to a sister, talking to a, a retiree, but not necessarily talking to each other. They had to learn to serve the needs, but also to learn how they could do that as a group. And that was a big transition because they came from such different cultures. And we literally had situations where we would sit in the room and had structured discussion to learn from each other. We also had situations where we would line up. Okay, where are you on this? Where are you, where are you taking a stand? And we see some people over here, and some people way over there. And then we had conversations about, um, well, wow, that really seems selfish. If you came here to paint and just fix that, those uh, older women's homes, how selfish of you. Could you imagine being told that if you kept coming here to help and being told you're being selfish? That was a huge blow to some individuals. How could you say that? And so we had to understand, what do you mean by that? How do we understand each other? Which brought us, this is from a book, um, Servant Leadership Across the Cultures, 
from uh, Trumpeteer and Vera, Ver, Ver, Berman, sorry. Wow. And they look at this from, thank you, um, from a cross-cultural perspective. And really what it is is, how do you take those opposing values? What do you mean you're selfish? Because you want to complete a task, and you want to do it in the short term, and you want to really serve somebody and feel good about it. To how do we combine that, the other perspective was, if we hire somebody else, then we're contributing to the community, we're finding employment for others, that employment will serve others in the community, will serve others' family, as well as it will create some sustainability for the future. We hadn't thought, of, some of the Westerners hadn't thought about that. So how do we take that and combine it together? How do we take those opposing values and bring them naturally together, but it really required some of those tenets that we saw, for those of you here earlier, or for those of you familiar with it, Ken Keith, or, uh, Keith Kent and uh, Larry Spears, listening to each other, self-awareness, empathy. We had to have that. We also went from that one-dimensional to the holistic, as well as just from pure analysis, which we're really good at, as leaders, to synthesis. How do we bring this together? And also, how do we help others to rise to be those leaders and then spread that throughout the corporation? So <clears throat> as we wrapped up uh, our week together, Kelly skipped the middle part of the week, and, and uh, she was almost physically pulling some of my team apart about Wednesday afternoon because we really struggled with finding this common language. She sat us down and literally pulled us off the project. She allowed us to, through these exercises that she talked about, find some common ground and some common language. And really what that started to boil around was servant leadership. And even though the one group wanted to paint and the other group wanted to employ someone to paint, we both wanted the same thing. It just took us a while to recognize and to see that. And that was that common language around servant leadership. So just real quickly with the project, how did it end up after a week? Well, we were able to do some really great things um, for the retired ladies who were actually abandoned from their families. We were able to completely redo the living space that they were in, but we didn't do it with our own brushes. We did it by employing local people. And it was kind of funny because we ran out of time not being able to hit consensus, and then we wound up with that solution, which was an awesome solution to be able to employ people locally to make that project successful. Secondarily, we wanted to be able to do something that lasted beyond the five days that we were together with them, and so we recognized that by helping their vocational clinic and bringing in sewing machines, actually, to teach people how to sew, that that would provide them a career for support for their families and beyond. So there were a number of neat things that we did physically in the space that were very meaningful to that community. But I would say even equally or more so meaningful was what we learned as a team. And it was this whole concept of how can we bring out our inner person to be natural in our work environment and how can we use that in this very, very uh, cross-cultural team to speak a common language, not literally but figuratively. And so servant leadership for us helped us first of all to become a more high-performing work team. Secondarily, it helped us to be better individuals. And the amazing thing about this is the spread that this had, the impact that this had throughout Brady Corporation. And uh, when I look at this slide, this is the spread of servant leadership across Asia Pacific. My leaders went back, not under my instruction, but because of how they were moved by this week, it's sort of like throwing a pebble in, the, uh, in a pond and the ripples just continue to ripple. These are the types of things that my team did. For instance, our leader of, of uh, China, we just went through the largest acquisition of the history of the company where we were integrating American, Chinese, Swedish, and Korean cultures together. His feeling was the best way that I can bring this team together is through servant leadership. And so what he said, not me, but what he said is, we're gonna build schools in China. We don't know anything about building schools, but we figured it out as a team. And I'm really happy to say that we've now built four schools. And these are schools that would house 500 uh, students at each school, all over different parts of China. And we continue to try to commit to that one about every two years. 
in the Manila where we have a call center and sometimes people say, oh, you outsource jobs, you're looking for low cost uh, employment, etc. These people share the same values around servant leadership that we do. And once a month, our call center works on US time, so that's in the evening for them. Once a month, the entire day, they go out as a team and they work at specific orphanages in Manila. And the list goes on and on throughout Asia Pacific. And although we were an Asia Pacific team, the list also goes on in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I'm really proud that EJ Erica Joy Daniels is with us. She's part of my team in Milwaukee and has been driving a tremendous amount of this. A lot of it right here with MSOE, which is a great collaboration. And so where MSOE has servant leadership programs here that they're tapping into Brady volunteers for. Uh, Dr. Ottman is taking a team of students from China. She teaches a course doing business in China. I think that's the right name or close. She's taking a group of students every year. This Sunday she'll be leaving again to take her students over to understand the work environment in China. But the awesome thing that makes MSOE differentiated here is that Kelly weaves servant leadership into this and she takes her students outside of Shanghai and Beijing and Hong Kong and she takes them to these remote villages where we built the Brady China Hope Schools and she lets the students interact with them and help create their own servant leadership. So anyways, we could talk a long time about this, but thank you for allowing us to share our story of how servant leadership became the common language and the common denominator for us to build a high-performing work team. Here's contact information. This will be made available to you, or if it's not on the tables, I think this is on the tables. 